Bienvenue à tous à la table ronde de cet après-midi consacrée au coût de la violence contre les femmes en milieu de travail. Je suis Jean Lebel, je suis le président du Centre de recherche pour le développement international, une société de la Couronne située à Ottawa. Une société d'État qui investit dans le savoir, l'amélioration des conditions de vie, l'innovation et les solutions dans les pays en voie de développement. Nous collaborons avec des partenaires pour veiller à ce que les collectivités, particulièrement celles marginalisées, aient accès aux technologies, aux connaissances et aux possibilités dont elles ont besoin pour réussir dans un monde qui évolue rapidement. This focus extends to our topic here today. Gender discrimination is sadly present through much of society. This includes the workplace, where women experience disturbing levels of violence and harassment here and abroad. We have with us experts whose research illustrates the complexity of the challenges, but also the impact of solutions. Their research is representative of IDRC's intentional approach to better understand how we build gender-just society and ultimately end gender inequality. Figuring out the how part of achieving this involves a three-part approach that is relevant to development research and to our discussion. The three parts are collaborate, create, and communicate, C3. La première partie est la collaboration. On ne peut pas s'attendre à des solutions uniques pour résoudre des problèmes intolérables tels que la violence infligée aux femmes sur les lieux de travail. Par conséquent, nous devons collaborer dans l'ensemble des secteurs pour arriver à un consensus, pour renforcer la capacité et pour mettre en commun nos expériences. Il est plus que temps, dans bien des cas, que les responsables des politiques, les chercheurs, les acteurs du secteur privé et les organisations syndicales se rejoignent à la croisée des chemins, unis par l'objectif commun de bâtir des économies et des sociétés justes à l'égard de tous, des hommes et des femmes. La deuxième partie est la création. Afin de soutenir cet effort, nous devons également créer des politiques et mener des recherches qui ne se bornent pas à nous livrer la ou une solution, mais qui nous donnent aussi des outils pour transformer ces solutions en pratique. Entre la solution ou une solution et sa mise en place, comme on dit en anglais, « there is a journey ». Le troisième et dernier C est la communication. Nous ne pouvons pas passer notre travail sous silence. Lorsque nous découvrons de nouvelles façons d'aborder les défis de longue date, nous devons en parler, ce qui vaut également lorsque nous éprouvons des difficultés. Nous devons communiquer pour sensibiliser le monde entier pour que l'on comprenne tout ce que nous n'avons pas d'autre choix que d'agir. Here is how to... Ah, here... Oh. I like when they put so many H in my speeches. You know, as a French Canadian, pronouncing an H is terrible in English. Here is how those three C's, collaborate, create, and communicate, are crucial to gender transformation. We must collaborate because solutions to gender disparities require participation from all sectors. We must create enabling environments because gender barriers have existed for so long in some instances that they have become unacceptably entrenched in all too many situations. And we must communicate solutions and motivate their adoption because gender transformation requires changes to attitude, to policies, and to practice. It is not done in one day. It is a long journey. It is a long-term agenda. Au CRDI, nous sommes engagés à nous assurer que les projets de recherche que nous appuyons comprennent les deux sexes tant dans, leur dans leur conception que dans leur en mise en œuvre. D'ailleurs, je ne suis pas sûr que « comprennent les deux sexes » est tout à fait juste parce que euh, ici au Canada, il y a une euh, discussion qui est très animée sur euh, le déjarment euh, de, de cette question-là. Parce que chaque projet a la possibilité d'appuyer l'objectif d'une société équitable pour l'ensemble de la société, incluant les hommes et les femmes. We are fortunate today to have expert here with. We are fortunate to have expert here today, whose work will inspire you. I'm sure they are building bodies of evidence that illustrate the extent of workplace violence 
and how we can make meaningful progress towards reducing it. Thank you for being with us. And now I would like to introduce to you the person that will be moderating uh, the panel, my dear colleague, Sue Zabo, who is the director of the Inclusive Economies Program at the International Development Research Center. Sue is the head and has been the head for the last five, six years, Sue? Six years. Uh, of a multidisciplinary team, some members are in the room with us, that strengthens policy research capacity in developing countries on issues of economic policies, governments, and health system. Alors, c'est avec un grand plaisir que je cède maintenant la parole à Sue et à nos distingués experts qu'elle vous présentera, et je vous souhaite à tous une discussion très productive. Merci beaucoup d'être là. Thank you very much for being with us. Sue, up to you. Merci. Merci, Jean, et laisse-moi ajouter aussi une uh, bienvenue à tous. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, avant de commencer, je vais juste noter que um, les présentations seront en anglais, mais il y a des écouteurs uh, disponibles pour la traduction simultanée. Let me also then welcome to uh, the uh, afternoon's discussion our two panelists, Dr. Srinivasan Rajavendran and Drusilla Brown. You may have noticed from the program that we had expected to have a third panelist with us today. Um, unfortunately, she was unable to get a visa to travel from India. Um, but as we noted at a discussion this morning that we had over breakfast, we've um, certainly got a very interesting uh, discussion that we'll have today. Do you know, when we looked at the final conference program, the topic of um, our panel, the cost of violence against women in the workplace, perhaps seemed like a little bit of an outlier. But as we're going to hear from our panelists, the evidence says that at both the firm level and the macroeconomy level, we need to take this issue of violence much more seriously from an economic perspective not only because of the immediate losses, but also because of the medium-term implications for economic progress. Our panelists are going to bring complementary perspectives to this debate. Dr. Srinivasan Rajavendran is a lecturer in economics at the National University of Ireland, Galway. His research is focused on a number of major themes in the areas of macroeconomics, finance and complex systems, and political economy. His current work in macroeconomics is on engendering macroeconomics, with a particular focus on unpaid domestic work and its impact on aggregate demand, distribution, and economic growth. Dr. Srinivasan's research is underpinned by the principle that economic systems cannot be viewed independently of the wider socio-political um, context, and he has also served as the Associate Director for Multidisciplinary Research, where his role was to create capacity for using novel research methodologies for addressing global and regional public policy issues. Professor Drusilla Brown was appointed assistant professor at Tufts University in 1985 and was promoted to associate professor in 1992. Her primary area of research is the application of large-scale general equilibrium models to the study of international economic integration in the Western Hemisphere. Professor Brown has also undertaken research on trade policy concerning international labor standards and child labor. Recent publications have appeared in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, The World Economy, and the Review of International Economics. And I would also note that Professor Brown is the lead coordinator on an IDRC-funded project empowering women through humane workplaces, garment factories in Southeast Asia. So I'm going to ask each of you to spend about 15 minutes talking about both some of the key questions your research has been addressing, as well as some of the important findings from your work. From there, we're going to go into a little bit of a discussion, and then I'm going to turn it to the audience to, uh, to pose your questions, um, to which we'll continue the discussion. So to start, Rajavendran, I'd like to turn to you and uh, your presentation, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is taking from my recent research 
and linking the issue of violence in a, in a macroeconomic context. So, as we all know, I mean, violence against women is a pervasive uh, issue across all countries. The most common form of violence is the domestic intimate partner violence. Almost one in three women around the world uh, you know, face the consequences, suffer uh, violence against women through intimate partner. However, there's a growing, increasing concern in terms of violence against women at the workplace. While there is a lot of study uh, in terms of domestic violence, the consequences of intimate partner violence and the cost implications, economic cost implications, the very uh, relatively less number of studies in terms of the implications of workplace violence and economic costs, both for the businesses as well as the economy. So small number of studies, for instance, in the US, Cosmopolitan in 2015, they brought out a um, survey surveying about 2,500 uh, women aged between 18 to 34. They, they found one in three women uh, they were sexually harassed in the last 12 months in the workplace. Again, in Canadian context, uh, Angus Reid Institute, uh, they brought out a survey in 2014, which, which about 1,500 uh, full-time paid uh, part-time and full-time workers, both men and women. Their estimates suggested about 43% of women uh, reported sexual harassment in the workplace. 12% of men also reported sexual harassment in the workplace. Also about 48% of the total number surveyed, they reported in terms of incidents per uh, incidents of violence or incidents of harassment, about two to, two to five incidents of violence, whereas 28% reported more than five incidents of violence. Now, in terms of impact of the workplace violence, we can categorize into two, uh, two categories. First, the workplace violence is a direct impact in terms of productivity, workers' productivity. Now, it not only affects the survivor's productivity, but it also affects the people who are assisting or witnessing the survivor. Okay. Second, there is a spillover effect of violence from intimate partner violence into the workplace. Uh, particularly, you know, it affects business output in terms of the victim's productivity, as well as men as perpetrator. They also lose a uh, number of days of work. They also go through uh, productivity loss. So both in terms of absenteeism and presenteeism, where when they work, but the concentration is not there, they're not productive enough. So in both forms, both measures, one can capture the effects, the impact of, of the domestic spillover effects from the domestic to the workplace. However, these two are not you know, uh, distinct or mutually exclusive. One, one influences the other. Uh, workplace violence affects women when they go back home they are uh, stressed, and that creates further uh, rounds of violence, domestic violence, harassment at home, which when they again come back to work the next day. So there is a cycle, vicious cycle of violence between these two categories. And uh, moreover, the spillover effects of violence also affects not just the, 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 the survivor, or the victim of, of violence, but also uh, male, the perpetrators, as well as the people who assist and witness um, violence violent incidents. In terms of economic costs of violence in the workplace, um, there are very few studies. Uh, for example, in a Peruvian context, uh, Aristides Varahorna in 2011, he captures, he, he gives some estimates of, of, of uh, the cost. Uh, he says that women on average lost about 24 days of work per year due to workplace violence or nearly about 10.5 million workdays across all businesses, overall economy, overall in the economy, of which about two-thirds is due to presenteeism and one-third due to absenteeism. Men, on average, lost about 35 working days, or nearly 32 million days across all businesses, all the economy, overall the economy, with three-fourths three are due to presenteeism and one-fourth due to absenteeism. Another important dimension brought out by the study is, is the impact on colleagues who assist, witness, assist and witness the uh, partner violence and the workplace violence. The study estimates about 6.2 million days, work days, are lost by both men and women 
uh, colleagues at work across all, all the economy, or all businesses and all economy. Cambodian case um, brought out by CARE Australia uh, that brought a survey about 1,500 workers across 52 factories. They found about 3.3% of workers took an average of about four days, 3.9 days uh, in the last 12 months. Okay. And the direct, because of the direct result of sexual harassment. And about 3.5% of people, uh, they reported that their productivity is lost uh, significantly affected uh, due to sexual harassment. So the total costs estimated by CARE Australia in terms of calculating both absenteeism and presenteeism in the garment industry, this is, this is a study on garment industry in Cambodia, which amounted to about 0.5% of Cambodian GDP in 2015. Now, these are micro-level costs. So moving on from uh, the micro-level costs are compelling by themselves, you know, levels at individual level, women, businesses, households. But one of the reasons why the micro-level estimates do not enter into macroeconomic policy discussions is the quantitative lack of quantitative translation from the micro to macro, macro-level costs. Since macroeconomy is a network of, of firms, household, banks, you know, government, and the rest of the world, and given that businesses are located in this network, the impact of violence in individual businesses actually impact, affect other businesses because they are related in this network. So both the direct and the indirect linkages between the sectors you know, create what is called in economics a multiplier effect within the, within the economy. So shock, uh, some shock affects one industry, one sector actually propagates through the entire network and this is called the multiplier effect, and we can actually quantify these effects. So therefore, impact of violence um, against women does not stay within the household or does not stay within the business. It, 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 it also has a temporal dimension. It's just not about short-term absenteeism or presenteeism within the, within the businesses or within the household, but it, it, it impacts um, in the medium to long term, it impacts uh, children, it in impacts uh, the economic potential, future economic potential of the economy through human capital, limiting human capital formation. So based on a systematic survey uh, in Vietnam's case in 2011-2012, um, and using the secondary data on the linkages, both direct and the inter indirect linkages in the economy of Vietnam, we estimated the macroeconomic loss of violence due to violence against women um, is about one percent of Vietnam's GDP in 2012. So the the loss of income spread across both the urban areas and the rural areas, both the urban uh, tertiary educated labor and the rural secondary educated labor loss uh, suffer loss of income. We also estimated the multiplier loss due to violence uh, for both the individual sectors of the economy, some of the sectors, significant loss in some of the sectors like agriculture, the, the traditional sectors like agriculture, also the modern sectors like hotels, uh, transportation, retail and wholesale, and so on. So given, if you look at it from this, from this macro view, what you see is the loss, the economic loss that is, uh, that is due to you know, violence against women, both in the workplace as well as domestic space, it's a leakage in the economy. If you, if you think of economy as a, as a circular flow, it is an invisible leakage that is happening in the economy as we speak. Every GDP figures quoted you know, is actually does have this leakage. In fact, this leakage, given that this is a leakage, it actually acts as an endogenous destabilizer in the economy. Right? So every euro every dollar a government spends, suppose the leakage is 0.5, you are losing 0.5 of that one dollar spent, 50 cents, you're losing 50 cents in one dollar spent in social welfare programs. That's what this actually means. And this is invisible. It's not just one shot. It's there all through and through. It's, today it's there, it's there, in the, you know, it's like a, if you, over time, it, it builds up in a cumulative way. 
And given that economic efficiency is the fundamental uh, or the overriding logic in fiscal policy, minimizing loss due to violence uh, can be a significant contributor in, in achieving efficiency gains. In fact, this is even more important in, in the context of constrained fiscal space as we talk about right now in both the medium term and in the long term. So from this point of view, if you, if you, if you translate if you move from micro to macro and look at the mac economy as a whole due to interlinkages, what you see is the, the, from a point of policy point of view, the investment in provision and prevention of violence actually be, can be cost saving for the economy. It's not an expenditure, it is an investment that you make in the space that actually is going to give you efficiency in the system for both the individual businesses as well as for the economy as a whole. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is a particularly interesting perspective because I think many of us will have seen or read the recent publications from the World Economic Forum, from the World Bank, that tosses out those trillions sum of the potential benefits if more women were joining the economy. Um, and I think you know what you've presented is a rather sobering caveat to it's not just about joining the workforce. We need to be taking some other elements into account. And certainly when trying to convince policymakers about the need to look at issues like violence um, in the workplace, having the hard evidence um, I think is a really important piece for making that kind of a credible case. Drusilla, I'm going to turn it over to you, please. That was really interesting. Um, I, you've saved me about two sections of my talk. <laughs> um, uh, and I also want to thank the IDRC for convening this really important and interesting conversation um, and introducing to me to somebody who's doing, is as passionate about these issues as I am. Um, I would add one thing when we were talking about the cause, there's one additional piece that's really pretty critical, um, which is that one of the things we find particularly with sexual harassment, um, but verbal abuse as well, is that Abusers um, tend to avoid their, um, ab abusees, victims, tend to avoid their abusers in the workplace. And so uh, I'm sure all you have to do is think about how you felt when you were the recipient of unwanted sexual attention. And essentially what you do, you know what you do. You basically, you put blinders on uh, and you do everything you can to avoid that person. And so every single workplace requires people to communicate to solve problems, um, to basically go to higher levels of sophistication in the organization. And when you have people who are not even willing to talk to each other because of, um, because of the nature of their social interactions within an organization, it really is very devastating in terms of moving any, any uh, above sort of the most basic ways of organizing production. So I'm gonna focus um, what I, my comments on more why does this happen and what do we do about it? And as a, I'm gonna to talk to you as an economist, but I also have a collaborator who is a social psychologist and we've tried to understand uh, these abusive um, behaviors inside the workplace, both from both perspectives. And as an economist, I'm naturally gonna focus in on how the, um, how the, how the organization is structured in terms of accountability and, and structure of incentives. And one piece that we know is that when uh, when when uh, factories are are structured so that workers have what we call high powered incentives that is that they have to meet some kind of production target in order to receive a production bonus this is what we call a high powered incentive it sets them up for what we call quid pro quo sexual harassment that is their supervisor who's they are supposed to be um, monitoring their work and reporting whether they hit the production target may, instead of being actually looking how much they produce, maybe looking at whether they're responding to a sexual solicitation. Um, verbal abuse is actually flipped around. Uh, what happens there is often workers have get paid by the hour and they, their incentives are uh, underpowered. That is, they're not rewarded for their production uh, that they contribute to the organization. And so when that happens, if the supervisor is very highly motivated to hit production targets because that person's compensation depends very heavily on the production of their unit, then, but the workers themselves are not highly motivated, they're being paid by the hour rather than by the piece, what we see then is the motivational technique of, of, of choice at that point becomes a verbal abuse, that is screaming, uh, yelling, and, and, and pushing people to work hard. 
Now, so we can, we can look at the way the organization is structured in terms of the, the failure to align incentives within the organization from the bottom of the, um, the, the structure all the way to the top. Psychologists tend to look more at the social interactions, basically how those, those structures interact with social interactions in the organization that produce bad outcomes. Uh, and one thing I found out, I didn't know this, is that people apparently for whatever reason, have a natural underlying predisposition to sexual harass or not. And it turns out that there's not a lot you can do about that. Either you, you've got it or you don't. What, what really matters isn't whether a person has the predisposition to do it, it's whether they have the opportunity to do it and whether there's accountability. Um, and it turns out that in organizations where a person has opportunity to sexually harass, if they have a predisposition to do it, they will. But, if they, um, but even if they do have a predisposition, if they're an organization where, where there are uh, organizational norms prohibiting it, they won't. Uh, and so it turns out that when, when you can control sexual harassment and verbal abuse, both by controlling the structure of incentives, but also um, uh, affecting um, accountability and organizational norms within, within, the, um, within the firm. So making sure that when a supervisor um, is making a decision about who gets production bonuses, that there's some connection, that there's some accountability to the organization, that those bonuses are given actually for real work, not for the, for the response to um, some sexual favor sought by the, by, the, by the individual. Now, what do we do about remediation? It turns out that if you focus on, on very specific remediations, we can actually solve a lot of these problems. Um, you know, restructuring incentives properly is a fairly straightforward thing to do. Um, organizations deal with it all the time. Um, improving accountability uh, so that there's a, 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 an accountability system will, uh, will reduce the amount of um, verbal abuse and sexual harassment that goes on. We've also discovered that supervisory skills training is really critical, that is providing supervisors both with, um, the, with uh, the capacity to use positive and motivational techniques rather than negative ones, and also to understand their accountability to the organization. Uh, we've also discovered that empowering workers, that is uh, particularly empowerment around um, gender is, uh, is particularly critical. Um, and, then, and then we've also discovered um, that monitoring workplaces is really important. Uh, that it's, that I, I'll just give you a, a small little anecdote coming from Tufts University. A lot of American universities were recently targeted for, um, for problems with sexual assault on campus. And I don't know if this is a problem in, in can, Canadian universities as well, but it's a, it's a pervasive issue in, um, in the US. And what was really kind of striking was the US Department of Education essentially informed Tufts among, among many schools that we were in violation of some of the main non-discrimination um, laws in existence um, in the US. And our president, the president of the university, when we were informed that, simply went ballistic. He just exploded. And, uh, and he basically withdrew from consultation with the US Department of Education over how to um, engage our mediation. So the students, of course, then proceeded to take over the university. <laughs> um, and they basically occupied the president's office, which basically had him trapped down. Um, and basically, they told him to re-sign or resign. And basically, what they were saying to him is, either you engage with the US Department of Education on this issue, or you are out. And he, and he bowed to it. So it was really interesting to see the double-edged um, sword, or the, uh, the, the sort of the pincer motion, of the, the danger of being exposed for being out of compliance, or the, uh, the punishment for being out of compliance by your stakeholders. And, and then, and then the, um, and so that sort of outing thing, and then the, um, and then the, and then the rigorous uh, enforcement mechanisms that the department was bringing to the table. So essentially, what we found is that it, that in fact there are a lot of ways of changing the social structure of the organization, and changing the economic structure of the organization that really can can very straightforwardly bring these these behaviors to a to a, to heal. Um, and then, of course, one really big issue is making sure that women are part of the social dialogue writ large. That is, making sure that women are in positions of leadership, uh, making sure that they're part of um, bargaining situations. Uh, we found that you know, when women are at the table, it makes a huge difference in terms of uh, uh, the outcome for the firm. And in fact, it makes the firm perform better uh, when women are at the table. The real problem here is how do you drive uptake? 
Uh, and one of the things that we've discovered is that all this information about how bad these behaviors are for business somehow doesn't change, cause be, be, uh, be, um, businesses to change behavior. That is that you've got a CEO at the top of an organization and you can walk in and basically say, look, here's the evidence that sexual harassment, verbal abuse, physical abuse are having these negative consequences on productivity, turnover, uh, absenteeism, presenteeism. And for some reason, that evidence, the business case, doesn't cause firms to change their behavior. Um, the, uh, the other thing we've discovered, or there's a lot of evidence for, is that putting firms in a situation where they experiment with, with different ways of organizing that might cause them to discover the negative consequences of these behaviors for the organization also don't work. Um, and then uh, what we have discovered is a little bit of evidence that the way data is presented to them, that is the data visualization around around the link between factory structure and firm performance does begin to have some effect on the way firms behave. Um, this uh, this um, reputation effect is, is, in fact, turns out to be very important. Factories are very sensitive to being named and shamed um, in the world of, um, of, uh, of, of, the, of their peers and also of their customers um, and also of their, of their workers. Um, and then one last piece that we've discovered, and this is where the social psychology piece has been really interesting and informative to me as an economist, is how much time do I have? Because there's a little bit of a story. Um, should I? Um, Okay, good. All right. So there was. Uh, so let me just tell you why it is that ultimately we think this is so hard um, uh, to get factories and factory managers to understand that they have a, they have in, in themselves an interest in man managing this um, this problem, these this class of problems, um, and that is that there was um, there was a very famous study that was done in the early 1960s by a psychologist um, uh, Milgram who some of you may have heard of. Um, and essentially what, what Milgram was looking at is he, he was trying to study um, the willingness of people to engage in abuse if they were told to by somebody in a position of authority. And those of you who have graduated recently may be familiar with Milgram. Um, and essentially what he did is he put um, a supervisor in a position of, of, of tr giving instructions to a subordinate. And essentially the mechanism that that the supervisor was given to enforce his orders was the administering of an electric shock. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's very, it was a very um, destructive, it, no one could ever do this experiment today. <laughs> um, it, was very, um, it was very horrible. Uh, and in fact, it damaged people for their entire lives when they discovered what they had done. Um, but essentially what happened was that, um, that, the, that the supervisors began resisting giving these shocks because they were hearing the screaming of the, of the subordinates as they were receiving those electric shocks. Um, and, and yet, if the, if the person in authority came and said, give this electric shock anyway, you have to do it, the supervisor would then go ahead and do it. And so the, 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 big, the big headline from this experiment is how willing people are to abuse their subordinates if, if they're told to by someone in a position of authority. But for me, as a, um, as a person studying abuse of the workplace, there was a much more interesting part of this conversation. Because one of the things that they did is they, they broke the um, supervisors into two groups. Um, and one group was told that these people that you're shocking, they're just like you. That is, in the, in the terminology of, um, of psychologists, these workers were humanized in the minds of their supervisors. And then another group was basically told that these people are animalistic lowlifes. And therefore, they were, in the words of psychologists, they had been dehumanized in the minds of workers. So then the question, in, in, the, in the minds of supervisors. And so then the question is, what happens if all of a sudden the electric shock stops working? All right, so here you are, you're a supervisor, and you've been, you've been humanized. You think of these workers that you're just about to administer a shock to as people just like you, and then you give a shock but basically the shock doesn't work. It doesn't make the worker do what you wanted them to do. So if you're a rational human being, what do you do? Well, you say, I don't like giving shocks to people that are like me. It's not even working. Why would I do this? And so what happens for that group in that condition is that the response uh, to, to the shock not working, that is not making the worker do what they want them to do, is for them to stop doing it. But what do you think happened to the, um, to the, to the group where that had been dehumanized? 
they, here they are, they think of those workers as, as, being, as low lives. They're not really fully human beings in the mind of the supervisor. And what do they do when the shock stops working? Do they, do they rationally process that information and say, oh, shocking doesn't seem to work very well? No, what they do is they double down on the strategy that does not work. So essentially this brings about a really important lesson, which is when workers have been dehumanized in the minds of supervisors, they are not able to rationally process the negative relationship between abusive behavior and, and, and poor firm outcomes. So essentially, until we disrupt that fundamental mechanism that, causes, that basically causes them not only to do bad behavior or abusive behavior because that's they were taught or that what's come instinctively, they're not even able to see that it doesn't work. And they will simply double down on this abuse. So essentially what we have is, um, and, and this basically begins to shed light on why it's so hard to crack this nut of bringing this abusive behavior under control in workplaces. Um, so I'm gonna stop right there um, and Okay, I have to say that was rather depressing. Um, it's, yeah, but it's very, it's very interesting from the perspective of how does one get beyond this? Um, how does one look for where there can be possibilities for change? You talked a lot about incentives, Drusilla. So, I mean, if I can start, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were both talking was, well, You've mentioned a number of different actors. You've mentioned policy actors. You mentioned advocates. You've, you've talked about, um, obviously, the private sector a great deal and the incentives that are set up within firms. Often, I would say, I would think that it's really hard to get those different pieces um, collaborating, working to make change. And yet, as both of you were talking, I began to think that getting any one of them in isolation to change actually may even be harder, may not yield the types of outcomes that we want to see. And I just wanted, perhaps both of you, if you could comment on that a little bit, that you know, can you just see the firm without the reputational effects outside that others can see? Um, your student example was really interesting, that it took students or civil society, we could relabel them, to come in and make the change. Where, where is the potential for each of these actors acting on their own to change, or do we need to actually move towards um, collaboration, coalitions for change? Yeah, I think it's a very important question, and you know, the changing gender norms. You know, it, people say it's changing, but it's changing so, 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 so slowly that it actually is not changing. <laughs> Um, nudging individuals, incentives, uh, well, all this, you know, at an individual level might work, might not work, depending on the circumstances. I think having seen this for many, many number of years, and we know that this is, uh, now we have strong evidence, statistical evidence, you know, uh, scientific evidence on, I think we need to be more proactive and more collaborative, as, as you mentioned. Uh, in terms of creating uh, individuals to participate in this collaboration. For this, you know, specific example I can give is individual businesses should be kind of uh, taking up this, the New Brunswick Toolkit. And it's part, the New Brunswick, uh, Brunswick Toolkit is a, is a kind of a toolkit, online toolkit, where it, it advises, uh, you know, you, you can take part in that individual firms, it basically says what, what are the items that should be done mm -hmm. in terms of uh, being helpful to people, how do you change the workplace, flexible workplace, and so on. It, it is a, it's a kind of a very straightforward uh, online toolkit. One, one, uh, so these are kind of small things one can do, but it has to be in a collaborative way in a, at, a, at a larger scale. It's not individual firms might or might not take up this. So it, it, it needs a policy action at a, at a, at a slightly higher level. Um, that's, that's my first take on it, depending on, yeah, what, let's, let's discuss. I mean, that's my first view on that. Great, thanks. Drusilla. Uh, I was really grateful for you to bring up how slow norms are changing <laughs> or how not they're changing. Uh, my, my daughter, sent, she's a junior in high school, she sent a text through this morning. She said, the weirdest thing happened to me at Starbucks this morning. 
I, uh, me and a group of my friends, they're all young women, were standing in line waiting to be uh, served. And a man just walks up and just gets right in the front of the line. And the barista basically says, you just got in line in front of all this line of women. And he's, oh, you know, he's sort of taken aback and surprised. And as he turns uh, to go to the back of the line, my daughter looks at what's written on his T-shirt. And what it proudly says is, this is what a feminist looks like. And I'm like, yeah, right. That's exactly <laughs> what a feminist looks like. And that is the problem. It was a pretty disheartening thing for a, a young one, you know, thinking about becoming an engineer to see. Uh, but I, b I agree that um, the, the multi-stakeholder initiatives are capable of being very effective. And I don't want to toot the ILO's horn too much here, but I have seen it in action in a way that really is quite effective. Um, that the International Labor Organization has created, an or, uh, created a, um, a unit called Better Work. Um, and it's a collaborative agreement between the International Finance Corporation and the International Labor Organization. Um, and it basically, they, it's a very deliberatively multi-stakeholder. So what they've done is they've engaged the buyers at the top of the supply chain, the factories, the unions, the workers, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the um, governments in, in countries, and also the UN. So it's a, they basically are pushing on all cylinders. And when you, see, when you see successes, you can see that it's the bringing together of all stakeholders in the room that really allows them to come to, to, come to success. But just for an example, I can tell you uh, one of the pieces of work that we've done um, has, has to do with the role that um, buyer behavior, that is the way sourcing practices work in a supply chain, not only uh, contribute, but they undermine attempts on the part of factories to, to actually remediate. So verbal abuse is one of the issues that we've looked at a lot. And we know that one of the things that drives verbal abuse is supervisor stress. Uh, that is that even if you have a well-trained supervisor who's been provided positive motivational techniques and the organization is all nicely aligned with incentives um, properly, properly established, if there's too much pressure on the supervisor, that person, it's called cognitive load, when the person hits some limit, they will simply start screaming. And anybody in here who's a parent knows that feeling. Uh, it happens to the best of us, no matter how well-intentioned you are, no matter how much you love your kids, there's going to be a moment when you feel overwhelmed and you're going to start screaming. And it happens to supervisors all the time. Well, w the question is, what's driving all the supervisor stress? It turns out that what really is the biggest driver of supervisor stress is the behavior of the buyers and their sourcing practices in the organization. And one of the things that they do is have what we now have, have identified as overpowered uh, incentives. That is that they, that the delivery penalties for failing to deliver on time are so punitive that if a factory misses their target even or their delivery date or the quality targets, it can literally drive them out of business. And we've in fact seen this as cases where a factory, in order to deliver on time, all of a sudden have to be um, uh, hiring airplanes and actually instead of sending them by boat and container ships, which is very cheap, they're basically um, a, a fly, flying product to, to market, which is an extremely expensive way to deliver. And, and in fact, it can uh, literally bring them to a close. So this is a case where you, until you basically control the, the behavior of the buyers at the top of the supply chain, you're not going to be able to control the what's going on inside the factory. So this is really a multi-stakeholder kind of issue. Another case where we saw this was in Jordan where um, there was a lot of the way the law was written. You know, there was this huge accusation against Jordanian firms uh, that uh, around human trafficking. The problem is that the factories, human trafficking was the optimal strategy given the regulatory environment that they were functioning in. That the way the labor law was written in Jordan simply made uh, forced labor and human trafficking, the profit maximizing thing to do. And so what, what we were able to do was work with the Jordanian government to, ch to rewrite labor law just enough to, um, to basically move the profit maximizing strategy away from human trafficking to something less, less abusive. Um, it, it, it was still abusive, but it wasn't as bad as human trafficking, which is really kind of the worst of the worst. Um, one other experiment that we've done is we were looking at trying to rehumanize. That is, we wanted supervisors to see workers as more like human beings um, as a way of maybe getting them to process information more rationally. Um, and we, in fact, the experiment backfired in a gigantic way. 
uh, because what happened was that we, we randomly assigned supervisors to these two different groups. One was going to be uh, engaged in what we call perspective taking, that is thinking about what their workers are, are like as human beings. And the other group was simply thinking about themselves. And then we presented them with some information. One was good news and one was bad news. The good news was the workers were rather highly satisfied with their supervisors. The bad news was that about half of them felt like they were being yelled at all the time. So it was a good news, bad news kind of story. And what happened was that the rehumanization exercise was so upsetting that the supervisors reacted not by rashly processing information, but simply pushing it away. Uh, that they just didn't want to have anything to do with anything that suggested that they were bad people. Um, and so it really, it was, it was kind of, it was very enlightening uh, to show us really two kinds of sides of this. One is how hard that rehumanization piece is, how critical it is, and then how important this look to understanding the whole um, uh, terrain of, of, of what produces abusive outcomes at work. Hmm. You know, one of the things you, you've mentioned a couple of times, and Rajivendra, I think it's come up in, in what you've mentioned as well, some of the pressures towards growth, but the pressures to deliver on time, the incentives at the factory level to be you know, ma making that profit, the incentives overall for growth. Um, in fact, we were talking this morning a little bit about this idea of the race to the bottom. Um, Given the lackluster growth performance of economies as a whole and the real search for solutions for economic growth, as well as what you've just described, Gisela, in terms of incentives at the factory level, um, how do we start to overcome that? Are there any bright lights, bright outliers, or positive outliers that we can see in terms of ways in which we might try to turn this kind of situation around? Yeah, I think the the, arg the race to the bottom argument is very, very, as we were talking in the morning, it's extremely, I mean, it's very difficult to break. Mm. Right? Um, it's not at all, I don't know how to break that argument. Um, <clears throat> one, if you actually go through the economic logic of the argument itself, uh, one can see some kind of contradictions, you know, some, some you can open up some space within the policymakers, you know, their their discussions, their rationale, because wage is just a cost, one part of the cost, the unit variable cost. You also have productivity, output per unit of labor is also part of that unit variable cost. So, on the one hand, when you when you want to bring down the wages, you might actually lose in terms of you know lowering productivity, right? So that can hurt the individual firms, not only individual firms, but also the economy as a whole, because uh, on the one hand, wage is going down, so there is no demand in the economy for. So in a sense, the argument of intervention of, of government investment in the space, or even industry level you know, uh, economic zones investment, I mean, there has to be some way of public good nature, uh, of investment as a public good in, in, in care services, in, in accommodating, uh, because it is matter of fact that women spend, you know, an unequal time in terms of unpaid care work at home as well as you know they come and work in the in the workplace. So, if you actually try to concentrate on the productivity part, right, you can actually more than uh, gain in the short, in the medium to long term. Because your businesses can be sustainable, because you, you are you are basically creating conditions for uh, productivity, increased productivity of the labor force. I mean that is that is that is the economic way to uh, argue this case, saying that you are only looking at short-term profit making today, tomorrow. That's it. Uh, no matter what happens in the medium to long term, because productivity is not just about women's productivity in the medium, but also children who are growing up in their houses. You know? So you're, you're talking about future uh, economic potential of the economy. It's not just about when, when the crash happens, everybody suffers. That's, that, that, that's, the, that's the way I can work within the economic logic of race to the bottom to show that, to open up that space for, for individual uh, you know, businesses and firms to think that you know, it's not just about you as, as, as an individual, you know, you are located very much in a broader, uh, in the economy. 
that's 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 one way to one way to start, start. At the, yeah. uh, the issue we focus, I tend to focus on the internal aspects of the firm, that is how what a firm is choosing to do is bad for them themselves. But then you, you focus in on the macro side, which is not only is it bad for the firm itself, it's bad, it, 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 there are external effects of one firm onto another. And from one, and so when you, you know, when you drag down wages, you're dragging down the, cons you know, basically, you know, your worker is my, is my consumer kind of picture. Um, there's one story that I think is, this is a, is a great success story, and it's the, it's the story of Cambodia, um, which is in uh, in 1999. The uh, the Cambodia was coming out of this the Pol Pot era, and the um, the head of the government approached uh, the Clinton administration in the United States and basically said, "If we can prove we have good working conditions, will you give us better access to your apparel market?" And Clinton had just been wiped out in uh, in the. Um, he'd been destroyed, in fact, in the World Trade Organization. The, the idea that we would link trade and labor was something that was verbatim in, in the international trading system. It was a position that Bill Clinton had pushed very hard, and he was really uh, raked over the coals on it. And so when Cambodia said, well, we would actually like to link trade and labor, just you and us, uh, Bill Clinton said, sure, let's go for it. Um, and so this program began in, in 2001, um, and essentially what, what Cambodia agreed to was uh, that they would they would have inspections of their firms, and these and the outcome of each of each individual inspection would be uh, would be public. That is, ed every single factory they would be inspected by the ILO, and then the outcome of the inspection would be, would be public. And then and then what would happen is after the U.S. government read the report about the performance of the entire market, the um, the government the, the U.S. would then make a decision about how much access to um, uh, to the U.S. market, the Cambodian apparel firms would get, and so you, we created this really interesting ecology where uh, every single organ firm knew that the their access to the U.S. market depended only on not on their own behavior, but on the behavior of the entire C Cambodian industry itself. And not only did they know that it wasn't only their behavior itself couldn't move the market, but collectively they could move the market. And they knew who the bad actors were. Um, so, and then there was this reward at the end of the tunnel. And it was, it was a hugely successful um, a program where the, there was a dramatic improvement in, in working conditions in, uh, in Cambodia. Now, the, the problem, so what we, what we had is this public disclosure that is the shining of the light on the, on the, on the bad firms. There was a, a very direct reward for good behavior on the part of, uh, on the part of factories. Uh, and then, uh, and then this sort of awareness of a collect uh, uh, that they were a collective. Now, unfortunately, two things happened. One is in 2005, uh, the the whole system whereby the U.S. could reward combatant firms was was eliminated with the um, the creation of the World Trade Organization. So there were no longer these rewards that the United States had to offer. And then also the Cambodian uh, firms were so uh, concerned about this public disclosure that they simply put a lot of pressure on the ILO to stop it. So they got rid of public disclosure, and they got rid of this, the reward system, and all of a sudden, um, this decay sets in. And even though we were able to demonstrate that compliance, the factories, the more compliant factories actually gained a, in business terms, that is, we, we did this little experiment where we essentially looked at factories to see um, how, they st how they fared during the financial crisis of 08, 09. And it turns out that the factories that were the most compliant were also the factories that were most likely to survive the financial crisis. So there was a very strong case that good working conditions were making these factories more resilient at the very least. But when you took away the stick and you took away the mechanism for um, creating this sense of a collective, Things started coming unraveled pr pretty quickly. Uh, it, it took a while, uh, but it but it but in the end, uh, the the unraveling occurred. And when they attempted to re because so once we basically brought the evidence to them that public disclosure was so critical to the success of the program, they reintroduced it. But but by that time, the carrot of the of access to U.S. market was gone, um, and so re re recreating that sort of moment of um, of clarity for the Cambodian firms really never. Uh, it was not sustained. So it was a really, it was an interesting case that even though as an economist looking down from the top, we could see what the elements were that made that a success. Without the carrot and without the public disclosure, 
uh, we couldn't we couldn't maintain it. Uh, so I know I'm a little bit of downer, <laughs> Debbie Downer today, um, but it, but I guess this is really a hard problem, uh, very very hard. Right. It's a it's either a one step forward and two steps back, <laughs> or maybe one and a half steps uh, yeah. or half a step yeah. back um, kind of example. Sorry. Well, yes, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, while while you were talking, I was thinking probably you know as a multi stakeholder approach. Uh, in terms of you know NGOs and ILO organizations, they should have some kind of um, like public disclosure. Firms, as part of corporate social responsibility, they should uh, uh, they should uh, say, you know at least they should uh, report on the gender equality index. You know some some such thing uh, in in terms of individual firms because as you know you know the rating agencies they 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 they, they rate uh, firms based on the economic fundamentals what about the social fundamentals of the firm you know what is the uh, gender equality how does the firm work as a as a social organism i mean that that is not brought out in this conversation and as part of the corporate social responsibility this should be uh, one of the items that they should report and uh, uh, and nudging in that direction would be one way to go uh, in terms of active policy Great. I want to turn to our audience now and um, see what questions, um, comments, uh, and perhaps your own experiences that you would like to add to the conversation. Have any questions? Cam, please uh, just let people know who you are and uh, then we do have a mic traveling around, which is necessary both for the interpretation and um, for the recording. So if you can please use the mic. Sure. Oh, really loud, <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, my question, I know you're both economists, so, but, so my question is a little bit different. Um, so it's really related to perceptions and how it varies across different local contexts, you know, and that may be related to cultural norms or values. So in this context, I was wondering if your research, whether the current research you're doing or in previous ones, whether you looked at the perceptions of young male workers uh, in regards to um, understanding women workers' vulnerabilities, including uh, workplace violence, and how these experiences or perceptions differed across the different countries that you've worked in, and whether you feel like, so you talked about collective um, collaboration and whether you felt that young males could be mobilized in the efforts to help um, prevent workplace violence. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll answer the easy one first. Um, <laughs> well, you think of an answer to the, to the hard question um, is that um, we, we have measured um, these attitudes around gender in about 14 countries in the US. And, the, and, we, and we see a lot of cross-country variation, for sure. Um, that the, you know, if you look at, at Vietnam, we find a very, very low report of verbal abuse and sexual harassment, uh, you know, around two, three, four percent of respondents. Uh, but in Indonesia, basically what we're getting is about 85 percent of workers reporting. Some, yeah, um, it, it's so there, there's a huge difference. Now, you might want to ask yourself, well, what the heck is the difference between Indonesia and Vietnam? And our suspicion is that it's not so much a difference in how much actually occurs as it is a willingness of people to voice. Um, and that in Indonesia, we just simply had more voicing. Um, and that really goes more, so it's, so, you know, as an economist, I'm gonna tell you that the core behaviors uh, are, are, pretty, are pretty universal. Uh, but, but the context in which people voice and how they process it is, is very different. I can also give you another example that where I think culture ma mattered a lot is, uh, when we, again, we were, when we were looking at Vietnam and we were looking at the impact of improving work conditions, one of the things that we found is that it increased the probability that girls were in school. When we did the same, uh, same kind of intervention in Myanmar, we discovered that it increased the probability that boys were in school. And so, you know, where people are in terms of gender, place, how it plays out affects, is, is very strongly affected by how the, um, where the culture is in terms of girls' education versus boys' education. But there, there again, it turns out that the difference is not cultural. It actually has to do with how much farming is still a part of the society. 
and that boys in, in, farm, in farming communities, boys are more valuable. Um, and so th where you see low education, attainment is in boys. And so what you, when you're trying to close the gap, you're trying to close the boy education gap. But in, pl and, but in places where, um, where manufacturing is dominant, then girls are more valuable. And there the education gap you're trying to control uh, closes the girl in school gap rather than the boy in school gap. Um, so there, you know, so I'm, you know, as an economist, I'm probably going to always drag you back to some kind of fundamentals as opposed to sort of some deep cultural differences. Um, we also encountered this issue um, uh, in, in Haiti where, you know, we were seeing a lot of sexual harassment in Haiti, but it was sort of, uh, it was sort of on par with the same level that we were seeing um, with Jordan. And, and so if you just, if you're in, your, in, your, in Haiti and you see a lot of sexual harassment, I kept hearing from Haitians, you have to understand this is Haiti. But when we actually looked at what was real, and so, and so of course you're gonna see a lot of sexual harassment because this is Haiti. But as an economist, I said, well, you know, there's nothing about Haiti. Uh, what's making Haiti somehow different than Jordan? Um, and it turned out that it wasn't really a difference in culture. It was a difference in the structure of incentives in the organization and accountability. And so when you improve the structure of incentives and accountability, Jordan started looking, uh, Haiti started looking a whole lot more like Vietnam. Um, so um, I'm going to let you sort of dive in on the boy question. Yeah. <laughs> Since you're a boy. <laughs> yeah, this is a uh, very challenging question because it's, uh, I, don't, I don't have direct experience of engaging in studies in terms of masculinity. But I know of studies in India, particularly in Delhi, um, studies on um, gay couples, uh, both male, male as well as female, female. Interestingly, in male, male couples, the, the, the patriarchal gender norm is reproduced in, in the male couples as well. Um, so in terms of focusing violence and gender norms, I think the issue of masculinity is, is quite important. I think we need to unpack this masculinity um, because we're, I was growing up in t South India, uh, you know, folk tales, for instance, you know, everywhere you turn, it's all, it's, it's, a, it's a reinforcement of gender norm, you know. So focusing on young males, um, on male behavior, looking at the issue of masculinity in terms of understanding gender norm is actually quite important in, in transforming um, you know, our, our interventions here is, is quite crucial. And um, I might slightly disagree with you on, in terms of incentives, but it is kind of, in a, in a, it's rooted culturally in, in many different uh, parts. I, I'm always fascinated by folk tales for some reason. Um, I always wanted to study folk tales from different areas and uh, different countries, different cultures, to see what is the gender norm uh, that has been told in these stories. Um, in, uh, I can give you one example in my, uh, I'm from Tamil Nadu, if you, anybody knows South India. And in that part where I was growing up, um, tamarind trees, tamarind trees are supposed to be you know, huge trees and very dense trees. But tamarind trees were supposed to be the place where ghosts live. That's, that's the belief. That's, that's, that's the, so when we were kids, as young boys playing cricket and uh, you know, throwing around and so on, one of the challenges to, uh, you know, anybody who goes by the tamarind tree in the middle of the night at 12 o'clock is the man. <laughs> you know, these kind of stories, it's there in your mind all the time. You know, it reinforces patriarchal gender norms. In, in, it, it, it's not, you know, somebody tells you, but it, it is there. It is there to, in, in many different, uh, it is shown in many different forms, art, or folk tales, mm -hmm. or music, or movies, drama, everywhere. And I think it's extremely important to look at masculine behavior, masculinity as a, as a, as a I mean, that's where the intervention should uh, focus on. I'm going to add one more addition. We actually did um, a women's empowerment training in, um, in Bangladesh and India. And, but that it, was, it was a training that was done for men and women because they were trying to go at this issue of, of um, of basically, I, I, of uh, what you know, what the norms around gender are. Um, so it was they were trying to go after things like if you um, to try to get people to understand uh, that the um, that 
they're, they're, that in terms of ability, that there's no difference between men and women. Um, and so that to, to really break down some of these stereotypes that people, that people bring to the table. Um, and it turns out that the people that were affected by, um, that most affected by the training were people who were already in a, what we call a high power mindset. That is, they already felt that they had a lot of control over their lives, all right? Well, guess who you think, guess who feels like they have a lot of control over their lives? Um, men, um, right? So it was really pretty interesting that it was one of these backfiring situations where we thought what we were gonna be doing is empowering women relative to men by talking about sort of trying to break down s stereotypes. Um, but the people who really felt empowered at the end of the day were the people who came into the, to the training with a high power mindset. And, and so what we ended up having is men much more likely to report a change in their ability to negotiate um, conflict uh, than women. Um, so it was, it was interesting, but I agree with you. There's, there's a very important uh, narrative around what's the, what's the construction of masculinity. Um, and particularly toxic masculinity. And I think that there's, that's uh, the one time a, a school counselor said to me, you know, 20 years ago we were losing girls uh, and today we're losing boys. Um, and it's, it's really quite shocking. Um, I don't know if it's as much the case in other countries as it is in the United States, but, um, but, the, but the impact that culture is having on how boys think of themselves and the investments that they're making in themselves and their conceptions of girls are really quite destructive. You know, in many organizations, including my own, um, we have this debate about are we looking at empowering women or are we looking at issues around gender equality? And I think many of the things that you've said really illustrate why we need to keep that wider frame about gender equality. Yeah. Heloise. Yeah. My name is Heloise Emden, uh, Carleton University. I'm, um, I really appreciate but appreciated both of your uh, presentations, but I, I feel as though what you've presented are really two sides of the same coin. The one being, um, uh, uh, Drusilla, your point about the industry and the, and, and the value chains and the pressure that's being put on um, the garment manufacturers is a system. It's a system that that you are, you are looking at a proxy which is uh, you know, workplace violence and the, the pressure that those um, uh, manufacturers are under based on a, a, a global chain of activity. And um, then again, uh, you have, uh, uh, Srinivasan, you've been looking at the, uh, you, I mean, you, you highlighted very well the, the cultural dynamics of um, paternalism. Uh, I don't think they, that I mean, I personally think they two sides of the same coin, and why is it that manufacturing capacity is now in countries where that kind of slave labor can be enforced? Um, but my thoughts went to, uh, because we were asked, how could we change, how could things change? And I found it very interesting, uh, my daughter, who's a, a teenager, is an activist when it comes to fast fashion. She is naming and shaming and working in, in environments. And I've, come, I've become aware of a whole civil society communities of people who are uh, working against the concept of fast fashion and the um, effect that that has on, um, uh, you know, on, on the workers as, as such. So my, my sense is that there is a civil society, there is that pin pincer that has to work. Um, how powerful, so that for me the empowerment actually has to happen amongst consumers as well to understand what the, the, the be their behaviors are um, with the, uh, and how that affects global chains and global value chains and global labor. So I do think the big organizations like, I, uh, the global organizations like ILO and so on play a role. I think nation states in, 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 in their setting of trade uh, rules and trade um, uh, conventions should be, th should be a lot more thoughtful and uh, reflective on, on these things. So b getting down to the firm and making the firm responsible when really we're talking about a much wider system of, um, of abuse. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you want to go first? Yeah. 
or you go first, I mean, if you um, I agree, um, yay for your daughter. <laughs> um, my, uh, my daughters are uh, very activist as well. Um, the, the, I, the, the consumer is the linchpin. Um, and without the consumer, none of this would happen. Uh, that in, and, and there have been many waves of uh, anti-sweatshop mobilization. Uh, the, you know, we're in the middle, we're in sort of deep into one right now, but there was another one that started around the early part of the 20th century. Um, so in the, you know, the 1990 going to 2020. Um, and, uh, and then of course there was the, the, early, the earliest one, which is the beginning of the, the 19th century. So the, and, and in each one of those, particularly this, this one, and particularly the one at the beginning of the 20th century, consumer outrage was the, was the driver. So if you look at the birth of the current anti-sweatshop movement, it is in, uh, it starts in 1994 with the, um, with the outing of Nike in, and their, um, their, their footwear and apparel factories in Indonesia. And what happened to Nike, and essentially Nike, what they sell is image. It's, it, that's, their, that's their thing, is all image. And all of a sudden, their image was the image of the sweatshop. And, uh, and, and within, within about a six month period after that, that public disclosure, that Nike stock lost 47% of its value. It was just, it was literally a crash. And Nike's first reaction was to say, these are not our factories, this is not our problem, we don't take responsibility for this. And the consumers and the stockholders said, yes it is, <laughs> and yes you will, and they did. Um, and that was really the beginning of, of, the, of this huge um, effort by reputation sensitive buyers to, uh, to, to basically clean up their firms and find mechanisms to clean up their supply chains. And what I think is particularly gratifying is, you know, at first it was, you know, thing, the really expensive firms like Nike that are selling, you know, selling shoes that cost $200. Um, but eventually it's, and, you know, in Reebok, you know, all these, these uh, firms that are very, very, that their reputation is so, t or their, their brand value is so tied up in their reputation. Um, the, but now, you know, you look, like, uh, you look at organizations like Walmart and Target and Kohl's that basically literally control the whole landscape of, of, of merchandising and sourcing. And they also are discovering that, um, that they simply have to take responsibility for what's going on in their supply chains. And, but, for the, but for the consumer, that simply wouldn't be happening. So. I really appreciate your question. I think you quite a perceptive question uh, in terms of the you know, the way firms are located in a broader context. I think it is one of the most important issues that somehow in economics that we have completely avoided it, um, not completely, but few people have. I think the issue of unpaid care work comes into play there. I mean, there is a relationship between the structure of production and the patriarchal gender norms. In fact, Few people have argued that it is, you know, uh, that it is, you actually require patriarchal gender norms for the survival of, of the production structure as we, uh, as we, for growth and development. I think this is quite crucial. Um, you know, it's, it's, it requires much larger work in terms of unpacking this relationship, um, particularly in, 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 all countries. It's not just about developed country or developing country, uh, particularly in the open economies where export zones are there and so on. There is a relationship between the macroeconomic growth and unpaid work that is done. At the, I think that is that is quite crucial. I don't think we see it uh, very uh, clearly because we don't have, uh, you know, frameworks developed in economics or in other uh, subjects to understand. What is the relationship between, uh, let's say, exchange rate and exploitation of women in, in, in the special economic zones? We don't have that. Um, uh, I think that's, that is quite important. I think your comment is very well taken. I think it's a very perceptive comment to, um, I think that's, 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 that's why you can see, the, uh, you know, you and high level uh, panel in, 2000, in April 2017 or even SDGs, they have a special mention of a special emphasis on this unpaid care work. I mean, it is now recognized that this is quite crucial. I mean, this is quite fundamental uh, to understand the how the economic mission works with all its different manifestations and so on. And I think that's, that's where I would, uh, I don't have an answer, 
I'm working in this area in terms of trying to figure out, I mean, there are, there's a group of people working in incorporating care into the economic system as a whole. And um, I think that's where we need to spend some time um, because uh, if we want to rewrite economics, it is from this aspect one should rewrite economics and rethink economics, not, not in other ways. I think this is quite crucial. Otherwise, gender equality and women's empowerment will be, uh, uh, we'll be talking about it for another many number of years. Right. I'd like to thank both of you. I think that you've both laid out a very convincing case for why we really need to think about violence against women, both domestic violence that comes into the workplace and has productivity effects, and violence within the workplace that has productivity effects. But I think you've taken that and talked much more widely about the effects, not just on the women themselves, but even on the perpetrators of violence and how that affects our wider society. And although you've laid out a lot of the challenges, I actually think you've left some ideas of what's in the toolkit. I think that there's, you know, the whole idea of bringing further evidence of the macroeconomic costs. We do need that. In today's society, we need that quantitative data to start changing mindsets um, amongst policymakers, amongst key institutions. And although you've brought up the example of the ILO, which I would call one of the converted, I think there's also evidence that the IMF, the World Economic Forum, others are also starting to look at this more closely. I think we've also talked a little bit about the incentives at the individual firm level, which need to be part of the solution, even if they can't in and of themselves be part of the solution, as firms sit within that wider economy, that wider global structure. And we need to look at things like transparency, reputation, branding, CSR, the consumers movement. How can all of those forces also be forces to turn this, we're on the edge of a sword here, and how do you use those other forces to make sure we're going towards the right side as opposed to the wrong side? And I can't help but say, being an economist, that I think that you know, hopefully one of those tools we're going to work on as we move forward into the future is also engendering economics, because I think that will have a really important um, effect as well. I'll just add note one note on the evidence part we are um, there's a current, there's a multi-country study funded by DFID uh, is undergoing, I mean, Ghana, Pakistan, and South Sudan, where some of the evidence that we are collecting on, on in the domestic intimate partner violence, as well as conflict uh, zones, uh, public places, as well as workplace. So it's, it's, uh, it's, the project is ongoing right now, and probably in 2018, 19, we'll start rolling out the results. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about those and I have left a few infographics based on that research, preliminary research that we have done. And if you're interested, you can have those leaflets and uh, you can always contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajivendran. Thank you, Drusilla. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a very interesting discussion. <laughs>